Excerpts from my translation of the Japanese linguistic landscape, Reflections on Quintessential Words, by Nakanishi Susume, published in 2019 by Japan Library Publishing. As always, I'll be reading two entries, this time Nagori and and Karo Tosen. Start with Nagori. Nagori, sorrows of parting. The term Nagori comes from two words, wave, nami, and leftovers, nokori. The word thus initially referred to those small waves that remain on the shoreline after the larger wave has receded. When the Japanese of old grasped this phenomenon and created a word for it, they did not find anything particularly lyrical or moving about its meaning. Their interest began at what the waves brought and left, the brackish seaweed in the hollows and the tiny creatures washed up on the shore. It was in pursuit of those leftovers that birds would fly down to the shore and people would gather on the beach. From an early point, however, people came to regard that Nagori as a beautiful beach scene. Moreover, I believe the reason our forebears regarded this scene of people and birds gathering on the beach as beautiful was that their hearts were naturally inclined toward things that remain, and they regarded these accidental objects as gifts bestowed upon them from the legendary sea god, sea god called Watatsumi. This is precisely why the association of the word Nagori, the leftover wave, with actual ocean scenes, quickly dissipated and took on primarily symbolic, metaphorical tones. The word Nagori eventually came to extend to all those remnant things that linger on in the aftermath of their sources, whether an actual thing or something less tangible, serving pragmatically as a linguistic expression, signifying myriad things that fade incompletely, the Nagori of such and such phenomenon, as we say. Take, for instance, the expression leftover moon, Nagori no tsuki. This refers to the figure of the waning crescent moon in its last quarter, after passing the full moon phase, and lingering whitely in the sky just as dawn starts to break. Another is the term leftover snow, Nagori no yuki, or snow that falls unexpectedly, despite winter having passed seemingly unable to accept the fact that winter is over. Nagori, it would appear, is used only in contexts involving a reluctance or unwillingness to part with something. Now, if you'll recall the origin of the term, the little waves that remain on the shore after the main wave has receded, then you can see just how far the term Nagori has traveled on its journey from its first meaning. What all these Nagori terms reveal is the extent to which humanity is unable or unwilling to let go of the past, to part with things that must inevitably pass away. And if you, like me, regard this essential facet of human feelings as something beautiful, the next time you close your eyes, you will no doubt see in your own heart too the image of a shoreline glistening after the wave has ebbed. Karo, now the next work, Karo Tosen, Useless Things. The expression Karo Tosen consists of four Chinese characters, Ka, Summer, Ro, Furnace, To, set Winter, and Sen, Folding Fan. The expression first appeared in ancient China, almost two millennia ago, in a book called the Lung Heng, Lung Heng, in, written in 80. CE. When this book found its way to Japan, it gained a favorable response and went on to offer an important new paradigm for reading literature. The meaning of the phrase is plain. A hot furnace, do, in summer, ka, and a cooling fan, sen, in winter, to. Accordingly, it refers to anything out of step with the season. The heat furnace, do, equates to the fireplace in Europe and the traditional irori, or sunken earth, hearth, hearth, in Japan. 
Nowadays, the term do probably refers to the heater and heating appliances in, in today's idiom. Heaters are indispensable in the winter, but they are completely useless in the summer. Idori in classic Japanese rooms sometimes gets covered sometimes get covered with a tatami mat during the summer months. That's why the karo tosen served as a metaphor for anything that is completely useless. But it was the great haikai poet Matsuo Basho of the 17th century who suddenly made the expression famous in Japan. When asked what purpose his haikai poetry served, he famously replied in his Kyoroku Riri Betsu no Kotoba on parting from Kyorika, 1693. The elegance of my poems is like a karotoseng. Basho attracted a number of people at the time with his new style of composition. Turning to his disciples, he told them that his haiku possessed absolutely no practical utilitarian purpose. That rather brazen statement delivered a sizable shock to his followers and eventually the entire world, literary world. What exactly did Basho mean by his response? There is a famous Taoist phrase that might provide a hint. The useless looking thing is actually sometimes useful. Muyo no yo. I think that's what Basho was aiming for in writing haiku. It is a common phenomenon that things we deem useless unexpectedly play a major role in shaping things when left alone. Conversely, those devious, nitpicky types found in every company office are no more than petty functionaries who are of no real use to anyone. In haiku, too, we see the same thing in those superficial poets who fastidiously ad adhere to the rules of kigo, season words without thinking deeply about the true impressions of each season, kisetsukang. This term karo tosen, though, suggests a much grander perspective than the narrow worldview inhabited by petty flatterers and haiku poet tasters who think only in terms of seasonal words. And poet tasters, poet tasters. And those who are preoccupied with the prospects of immediate gain the matter of whether a near-term thing is useful or useless, will never accomplish anything meaningful either, so long as they avoid engaging in self-fortifying experiences. Even today, we can hear the voices in our heads, whispers from time past, that remind us to put aside our petty concerns and value the basic way of life. Karo Tosen is certainly one word that I would like to continue to savor until my dying breath.